Hello, it's Alison here. Welcome back to the Gardening by Design box of tricks, where we're looking at the year-round garden. I hope that since watching part one, you have been out into your own garden and chosen an area that could look better, especially during autumn and winter, and that you've thought about the existing planting so that you can start to decide what stays, what goes, and what seasonal gaps you need to fill. But before you start choosing plants, it's time to consider how to put the whole border together. The year round garden. Part two, fitting in all those plants. At the start of part one, the question was how to have an interesting garden all year round for a realistic amount of effort. And the answer was plant diversity. At the start of part two, we have another how this time, it is how to fit enough of those plants in to a single border to cover all the seasons. The answer is not just to buy twice as many plants and whack them in closer together. I'm sure that you'd never do that, but some people might be tempted. No, you need a plan. A planting plan. Having a plan is a bit like an orchestra having a score. It means that different instruments playing different notes at different times all combine in a pleasing musical effect, greater than each one on their own. Creating a border in your garden is much the same, using all the different plant types with their points of interest throughout the year. And clearly, without a score or a plan, you just have a bunch of random individuals doing their own thing whenever they feel like it, which may or may not give you the result that you want. Great borders that perform year after year are quite an achievement, and one good way to fit in all the plants is to use layered planting. Now, this might be a term that is new to you, but layered planting is nothing revolutionary or weird, and it's very flexible to match whatever type of garden you prefer. It's not a design style, it's really just an approach to planning that helps you to make the best use of the range of plant types, shapes and sizes on offer. All the photographs floating across the screen are examples of layered planting, and they are exactly what they look like. Successful mixed borders, which reflect the changing seasons, with something always ready to take over as flowers or foliage fade. There is a natural ebb and flow, as spring flowers die off and the fullness of summer takes over. Full, mind you, but not packed so tightly that fights break out. And as autumn moves into winter, the border shows its skeleton, with trees, shrubs and the stiff stems of spent perennials before the whole cycle kicks off again next year. So let's look at how layered planting works and how it helps you. Well, layered planting is all about layers, not planting deeper, but using the vertical space above your border as well as the ground area. You have to garden in three dimensions. The great part is that you can fit in more plants to provide interest in all seasons and by using plants of different heights including trees and shrubs you create more interest and structure. We'll keep it simple by sticking to three layers. Plants that cover the ground and grow up to about 20 centimetres tall. Plants that reach eye level or the top of a typical garden fence, say 1.8 metres and above, and those that fill the space in between. Now, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between plant type and the layer it fits into, but think for a few moments about your garden and the plants that you see in the lowest, middle and top layers of a border. You can name plants or just describe a type or characteristic. The birds will twitter quietly for a while as you come up with one or two examples for each layer and then I'll show you how I divide them up.
we will look at specific plants in the final video. At the moment it's height and growth habit that we're interested in. In the ground cover layer, we use plants that trail along the ground and spread or form a low mound. These sit around and underneath the taller plants. The best ground cover plants create a loose mat that bulbs and perennials can grow through and are not so vigorous that they take over. In the middle layer are the smaller shrubs, ideally a mix of evergreen and deciduous, the familiar cottage garden perennials and ornamental grasses, and bulbs offering spring or summer flowers. At the top are the taller shrubs and small trees rising above the rest of the planting, along with climbers, either on a support such as a fence or a wall, a freestanding obelisk, or scrambling up through a tree. By careful planning, it's possible to have plants in each layer sharing the same area of ground, giving you two or three different opportunities for great colour as the year progresses. And the next step is to put that plan together. Well, I have said that you need a planting plan, especially as people like me are always telling you not to plant too closely together so that there is no room for the plants to grow. This drawing shows a flat plan of a piece of border. The sides of the rectangle represent the width and the depth front to back of the area. Plants are represented by circles with a cross or dot showing the centre where the original hole is dug and the outer rim marks the ultimate size. The advantage of such a plan is that you can be sure that the plants will not collide as they grow, that shrubs can develop their natural shape and that you won't be forever cutting back trying to separate them. However, there is a limitation when you draw a flat plan to represent plants in a garden, and that is precisely that the plan is flat. It only shows two dimensions. And as we have seen, in order to get the best display all year round, you need to consider the above ground space too. Plants come in all shapes and sizes and all heights, from ground hugging to large trees. Of course, these pictures are not to any sort of scale, and most of them are not even real specific plants. At this stage, it is shape and form that are important, and we don't want to get sidetracked into whether or not you like dahlias or the like. So let's put some of these plants into the plan and see the effect in three dimensions. And as I drop the plants into this 3D version of the plan, you will doubtless notice that they occupy each of the layers. The tree and shrub in the top layer, perennial flowers representing the middle, and a low mounded evergreen as ground cover. There is room for each plant to reach its full spread without clashing with its neighbour. But you can also see from this perspective that because the plants are in different layers, there's a lot of unused space. For example, beneath the canopy of the tree and around the base and bare stems of the perennials. When you use this space by adopting a layered planting approach, you can fit in all those plants you need to have something to appreciate in every season. This works because each plant needs its own space to emerge from the ground, but not necessarily all the way up above that. I have cheated very slightly by raising the canopy of the tall shrub in the centre. This simply means removing the lowest branches to give one or more clear stems, a bit more similar to the tree, and that allows space and light for plants underneath, and has the added bonus of creating a lovely shape to the shrub when the leaves are off in the winter. I'll show you a real example of how to do this a bit later. And there's still room for some spring flowering bulbs that will grow up through pretty much anything and are finished before the deciduous shrubs get their leaves and block out the light. One final plant type is missing. Can you identify which one? So here is a climber scrambling up through a tall shrub to provide flowers or autumn leaf colour at a time when the shrub itself has faded into the green background. And that is an example of layered planting.
Time then to summarise the key points so far before giving a few tips on how to make layered planting work in practice. Use the vertical space. Think of your border as a 3D jigsaw. Use all the layers. Follow the ebb and flow of plant life cycles. There is room for plants with long seasons of interest and high impact flash in the pan plants because each square metre of ground is used more than once. And start your planting with long term trees and shrubs that will provide a skeleton in autumn and winter ready to be filled out in spring and summer. If you choose specimens that stand out across several seasons with coloured or variegated leaves, flowers and berries, attractive bark or good autumn colour, then you will have the framework for a great year round garden. You'll be relieved to know that that's the end of the theory. I've got some practical tips and then we'll revisit some of the borders in the photographs at the start of this video now that you know what you're looking at. From the bottom, not all plants die gracefully, but that doesn't mean leaving them out. And there will be some short term gaps to fill as plants bulk up and those irritating in between moments. But firstly, I promise to show you an example of a raised canopy. So here you are. This is an Acer or Japanese maple that is remarkably similar shape to the drawing in the planting plan. Although I'm recommending this as a technique for shrubs in a mixed border, this specimen is conveniently planted in open space, allowing us to see the structure better. The base of the trunk has been cleared, allowing grass to grow beneath and creating an elegant vase shape. But for use in a border, I would clear a bit higher up to 80 or 90 centimetres, cutting away all the thin twigs that carry leaves. It's best to do this sort of work from the start, but you can retrofit if you have an existing shrub in the border. Incidentally, aces are great small trees or large shrubs for a garden with lime-free soil or even in a large pot. Many varieties have good spring colour in the new leaves. Great colour again in autumn like this one and a lovely sculptural shape in winter, especially if you raise the canopy. Not every border has to use all plant types. Here there are a couple of shrubs at the far end and the majority of the planting is made up of perennials with climbers on the wall behind. It's a good example to look at because there is absolutely no visible soil and therefore no gaps for weeds to appear. Instead, the gardener has allowed these small blue flowered forget-me-nots to colonise any empty spaces until the summer perennials have grown up to take over from the tulips. This photograph was taken in May. Now, for many people, forget-me-nots are tantamount to weeds, as they self-seed all over the place. But for me, they are friendly weeds, much prettier than the usual weed and easier to control. Similarly, you can use temporary bedding plants, especially good to fill gaps in the first couple of years while you wait for the long-term plants to bulk up, form a good clump. The key characteristic of both these forget-me-nots and other bedding plants, particularly summer bedding, is that individual plants die off after flowering. They don't live for years, send down deep tap roots or spread underground. So you're not storing up future problems, just adding a bit of colour to fill the gaps. As I said, not all plants die gracefully and prime examples are some of the spring flowering bulbs whose leaves must be left to die off naturally, but which can look truly awful as they do. Alliums, or the ornamental onions, are particularly bad as the foliage starts to die just as the flowers open. They are much too useful for early summer colour to be ignored when planning a border and the answer is simply to allow another plant to grow up around the bulbs and obscure their leaves. Perennials that spread a little and form a loose mound of foliage such as heuchera or this hardy geranium are ideal. And so we finally circle back to look at this example of an all year interest layered border. Here the red leaved shrub in the centre is key in the colour scheme, as you will have those leaves for much of the year and needs to complement both spring and summer flowers. You don't have to stick with the same colour all year round, but you do have to allow for unexpected overlaps as the seasons change. 
For example, even if you plan for yellow daffodils to be over before pink roses open, there is a fair chance that in some years you will have both in flower together. Now that you have seen how a border like this is put together, have a go at identifying the plants in each layer by description if you can't name them. Here are the birds again to accompany your thoughts. OK, let's have a look. By the way, this photograph was taken in early summer. In the bottom layer, we have two low growing shrubs at the front. On the left, a deciduous azalea that has already flowered and will give a second season of colour from the leaves in the autumn. Together with the red leaved berberis, the low evergreen ball provides permanent structure, almost overshadowed now by the strappy leaves and flowers of the bright yellow daylilies. And the middle layer. You can also see the remains of spring bulb foliage and one last foxglove. There is a clump of alliums showing white just visible at the back and these bulbs will be obscured once they start to die off by the perennials growing up to flower in midsummer in front of them. It is all topped with a climbing rose on the trellis at the back. There are also a few pink poppies probably self-seeding to fill any gaps which does leave no room for weeds. So you can see it is possible to fit in enough plants to have ever changing colour and texture throughout the year in a single border. This is a rather simpler border, but one where I can show you how it changes from spring into summer and autumn with a restrained colour palette that evolves gently through the year. Starting in spring with bulbs, tall blue camassia and white narcissus appearing through the dark purple bugle, botanical name Majuga, and bronze grass. By the way, the grass is supposed to be that colour, it isn't just dead grass. In early summer, the bulbs are over, and the attention shifts to the taller shrubs as they come into leaf. White flowered Philadelphus, a variegated dogwood, that's the corners, right at the back and a black cut-leaved elder at the far end. Lavender follows with a large clump of white Japanese anemone that will come into flower in late summer and take us right through to October, just as we return to autumn. And here we have the brighter colours of leaves just before they fall. Winter relies on the coloured stems of dogwood and birch with the ever-present bronze grass and carpet of evergreen alpines as ground cover in front. A final summary and part two will be finished. The key to year round colour is a wide range of plants and plant types and layered planting is a great way to fit them all into your garden. Plan your planting in three dimensions using the vertical space as well as the ground area. Although you will have something to look at all year round it is the natural cycle of plants in a temperate climate that borders will be full of lush planting in summer and simpler and more architectural in winter. So embrace the ebb and flow of plants to achieve variety instead of fighting it with good old car park planting. And establish the framework or skeleton of the border first with a mix of evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs. And remember, pick trees and shrubs with multiple seasons of interest. Raise the canopy where appropriate to squeeze more plants in underneath. Build up all the layers, each one peaking in a different season. The colour scheme can evolve through the year, but you should allow for overlaps and not make dramatic changes from one month to the next. And not every border has to contain every plant type. Pick and choose to suit your garden and your preferred style. So once again, we're going to take a break. And once again, there's a little bit of homework to do if you want to get the most out of this topic. 
As you think back over this video and have another look at your garden, decide if you have enough or the right structure from trees and shrubs. Possibly there are too many too close together and you may want to move some. Think about what seasons are lacking in colour, autumn and winter usually the most challenging. And match up unused spaces in any of the layers, now that you understand layered planting, to where there are gaps in that seasonal interest. Look at your existing plants too. Is there a colour scheme that you need to stick to? Or do you have a completely free hand? And finally, I reckon you can reward yourself with a cup of tea. And possibly, if you're making good progress, a piece of cake. And so we're done with this video. When you come back to part three, we reach the moment for you to start choosing plants and I'll show you some of my favourites to get you started on your own year round garden. See you soon.